Hey, welcome to the Lincoln Network podcast, where you can find a wide variety of conversations on technology, democracy, and congressional reform in Washington, D.C. You can watch these conversations on YouTube, and you can also find them wherever you listen to your podcasts. Garrett Aaron, welcome to the Lincoln podcast. It's good to be here. Uh, Very excited to have this conversation with you. Yep. Thanks for having us. Yeah, for sure. I always love, thanks for having us in the context of you guys being above me, <laughs> as if I was yeah. going to say, listen. <laughs> um, we, have a, we have a horizontal team, Marshall. You know, everyone <laughs> just works together. I love you. It's very new age. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually, it's actually a great way to start talking about the team and the way Lincoln structured. Can you all take us back to 2012, 2013 in terms of where the two of you were at in your careers in your interests and what led you to come together to want to form this organization? So I was fresh to the Bay Area, having left Washington, D.C. I was working in the Senate as stodgy and buttoned up of a place as you can get. Um, and so uh, it was a bit culture shock for me moving from Washington, D.C. Uh, to the Bay Area. Literally, like people talked faster. Like literally the cadence of speech was just faster paced in the Bay Area. And I had to get used to that as a guy who's generally from the South. Florida is not really considered the South, but parts of it is. Uh, uh, you know, I, I just had to change so much, so much of a learning curve. So uh, I moved up to the Bay Area to start a company um, that was accepted into Y Combinator. So it was a winter 2012, January 2012 class uh, that I, I moved out to the Bay Area for. Uh, and then uh, that, that next year in 2013, uh, I met Aaron over Indian food. Uh, and, uh, and that was my first encounter with Aaron. Uh, Aaron? Uh, yeah, so uh, I actually, so I was out in the Bay Area since 2010, uh, after I graduated um, from University of Texas and, uh, you know, sort of spent some time in doing finance and banking uh, and, uh, you know, before that, I was, was already interested in, in politics and policy because uh, the area of investments I was working in was healthcare. And just after uh, I started when I left college, you know, Obamacare just passed and it was this huge sort of impact on the healthcare system. And so I didn't know a lot about uh, politics is one reason why I sort of got my first job was because I already knew a lot about uh, Obamacare. And, and sort of the sort of future regulatory guidance was coming out. Um, so I spent, you know, a, uh, a fair amount of time just studying that and then, you know, got involved in, in finance. And then I actually got hired off of a, uh, to move out to the Valley because uh, I was writing on uh, Quora, which was a Q&A website back in the day. Uh, I was actually writing about um, sort of center right perspective on Obamacare and, um, uh, you know, choice in healthcare, pricing, transparency, all these different aspects. And there was a, a healthcare startup in, uh, that was looking for basically some marketing help and some product help for someone who actually was familiar with a lot of the space. And, and so, uh, so yeah, then left Dallas and moved out to Silicon Valley and uh, started working on product development. Uh, I taught myself how to code, uh, how to like, you know, analyze data, do design work. And then uh, as I was sort of working away at uh, my first startup, then, then met Romney ran for president. And then I uh, joined his team to work on a section of his technology stack. Uh, and then that's when I got involved in sort of the uh, growth hacking movement. And I was like the, one of the first writers on that, uh, prop, uh, basically pushing that concept of how do, you, how do you design virality? How do you look at user behaviors and tensions when it comes to product? Um, and, uh, and then that's when I came back to the Valley uh, you know, after working for, you know, I was very public on my, on my, uh, resume that I worked for Mitt Romney. Uh, and that's when, uh, Garrett and I got introduced, uh, actually by a moderate Democrat, uh, who's like, oh, look, there's another Republican. Right. Uh, and, uh, and then, so, you know, we, we, we basically, uh, that was the first time we met. So when you say moderate Democrat, you mean like a San Francisco Republican? Yes, um, basically, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He worked with Chris Christie, and he was a Democrat. So yeah, that's right. He, he, that, I just <laughs> when you say yeah. that, I, once again, euphemisms. Um, you know, yeah. Aaron, I've never, I've, I've actually never asked this, but if Mitt Romney had won, what would you have done? Were you going to go to D.C.? No, I actually, already I accepted a job, and I actually thought we were going to win, and I accepted a new job running product at StumbleUpon. 
to come back to the Valley because uh, I did not um, like the team and I thought they they uh, they did not properly invest in technology and in you know uh, in terms of the infrastructure and engineering talent et cetera et cetera I was very sort of underutilized and which there is a you know a lot of articles around 2013 uh, you know utilizing things I've uh, we're talking about sort of post uh, Romney uh, losing and in terms of you know criticism of how the center right movement uses technology things like that. So I already was committed to not to go, even though I thought that actually we were going to win, as sort of the rest of the campaign did as well. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I, it was the day after uh, they lost. Was actually I already had a plane to come back uh, to San Francisco. So I guess I made the right bet. Uh, but you know I, I did hope that he was going to win. So good to hear on that one. So here's how I want to do this because looking through just the press clippings and just the general history of Lincoln, I feel like the different eras of the organization have corresponded to different quote unquote problems that anyone who's center right to conserve the libertarian in the Texas would be thinking about. So in 2013, I suspect I know where your goal with this, Aaron, what would you, and to you too, obviously Garrett, when the two of you meet up in SF, you're connected by the moderate Democrat. What is the problem that's interesting you? and that you're focused on that's really getting you going? My, my problem was I moved from Washington DC after working on legislation to try and make it easier for uh, technology professionals who wanted to start a company to compete against Facebook or Google um, to make it easier for them to come to the United States. So they were foreign born, not Americans, they wanted to come to America to start the next X company. And it was incredibly impossible for them to do that. If they wanted to work at Google or Microsoft or Facebook, there's H1B and a few other ways for them to easily make that happen. Uh, and so that legislation was, it was called the startup visa. And, and uh, before I started to work on that as a you know, professional staffer in the Senate, um, you know, John Kerry and Richard Luger, who was my boss, a Senator from Indiana, they sponsored this legislation, the startup visa. Before I started to work on that, uh, that piece of legislation, I had no idea Silicon Valley existed or what happened in Silicon Valley. That really put uh, the tech sector on my radar. And so uh, I knew that there was a big divide between what was happening in the innovation space and literally everywhere else in the country, but especially Washington, DC. So, so I could see at that time an inevitable collision between the two worlds and so I thought, hey, it, it should exist a, a mechanism for those two worlds to get to know each other, better communicate. And so that was really my motivation for trying to, to create this type of organization. Aaron? I, yeah, so, you know, I, I wasn't, when I was working in the Valley for a couple of years before I joined the Romney's campaign, I, you know, I wasn't really, uh, you know, I, I would randomly write about it on Quora. Uh, you know, back then I didn't, actually I think I did have a Twitter account, but I never used it. And uh, that's right, yeah, I actually joined in 2010, it says on my profile. So, uh, but you know, I came back from, from Romney, there were a lot of people who emailed me saying, oh yeah, like I saw that you worked for Romney because I was already well known for like the growth hacking stuff. And so people saw that I was, uh, you know, a, a guy who was proudly put that he worked for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign. And, and you know, back then I knew there was gonna be some social consequence but I really didn't care. And, and, and that's when, you know, the sort of secret society within Silicon Valley of heterodox red pill people started coming out of the woodwork, and and we started seeing that like actually there was a hunger for uh, for some type of community, some type of of uh, you know free market, uh, free enterprise, small government uh, type of orientation in Silicon Valley. That that was sort of being faded away. Uh, you could say it's like in the original Web 1.0 guys were very much oriented to that, and a lot of them were basically you know Elon, Peter Thiel's, Mark Andreessen's, like they were those types of thinkers were looking for community as the sort of obama era web 2.0 folks came into uh into you know prominence in the valley like facebook era type stuff when the uh you know tech became very much much closer to government uh during the time underneath obama uh and and so those people were looking for other you know publicly identifying uh of that type of uh, philosophy. And, and so, you know, I was also, you know, because I'm inclined, I think that way, I thought that, yeah, like, there should be more community, more people that are thinking that way, uh, in terms of like innovation, and transforming the government to actually much more open towards uh, uh, the future economy. 
uh, that, that there, there has to be some uh, other lane in which those people can engage and also impact policy uh, and define each other because because they, they were sort of, uh, what's the right word for it? Like until that one person in the company sort of steps out as like saying, yeah, I can believe that. Then, every, then all of a sudden a bunch of other people show up too being, oh yeah, I thought that too, right? Usually it's the ones who never, usually it's the people who never say anything or comment about politics at work are usually the ones that are, you know, of that uh, uh, orientation. Very, it's, it's ironic and has been slightly borne out by uh, a bunch of recent kerfuffles in the industry, obviously, when it comes yes. to who's vocal and who isn't. So, okay, so that's great. So the year, we're jumping around a bit because I just like thinking around this to the context of like problems. So, you know, if it's when Lincoln is founded, really the idea is like community, we need to fill a community to fill a space. Like, let's just jump to the 2016 times, right? So 2016, 2017, like the, a lot of like the big issues that are just query, query being dealt with are the actual people who are working for those companies, right? So like the, the, the climate of a lack of friendliness to diversity of thought, you know, the various incidences, what was your just sort of diagnosis of the space and what the interest was given that context? Yeah, I mean, my thought was that this is not going to end well. Uh, that the, uh, uh, the sort of monoculture that was very evident in Silicon Valley um, a decade ago, when, when I first got there, uh, that it was only going to, to get worse as, um, as tech inevitably impacted more and more, permeated more and more uh, of, of, of the culture uh, and uh, sort of the middle of, of America, uh, that there was going to be uh, some type of allergic reaction uh, uh, to, to that. Uh, and, and, and we, we, we've seen that that's worn out to be the case. Uh, but, but, you know, that, that was my, my thinking uh, is that, um, you know, it, it's not inevitable, but it seems to be really trending that way. Uh, and, um, and, you know, most people don't realize this is that, you know, Aaron and I didn't come on uh, uh, full time until 2016, late 2016. Uh, and so, you know, although Lincoln started to organize happy hours in late 2013, 2014, we were both working full time. Uh, you know, this was very much just like a labor of love on the side. Uh, so when we came on full time, uh, you know, my, my immediate reaction was, you know, what, what gives us a competitive advantage that really no one else can do? Uh, and that was the, the technical work that we can bring. Aaron is technical. I work with a bunch of technical people uh, as a, uh, you know, startup co-founder. Uh, and so how can we... Uh, create a pipeline to to get technical people a seat at the table, both on the policy side. How do we create a level playing field with you know laws and, and regulation, uh, but then also on the actual building side. How do we build solutions, you know, to solve all of the policy BS that you know people like to argue about in Washington D.C. and state capitals around the country? You know, there's technology that could probably solve some of those problems. So how do we get those people a seat at the table? Uh, to really influence the debate. Yeah, like it, 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 you know, a lot of the trends that have sort of peaked uh, this year and really started, I think, uh, really kind of accelerating last year uh, and sort of came, the, you know, the sort of the culmination of uh, post uh, a Biden win in terms of this election uh, that uh, I think the, it's quite mainstream now to know that the, the Silicon Valley has a, has a political problem. And, oh, and you're seeing shocker. the kind of, <laughs> I'm just shocker, like, right? and so you see, <laughs> and so, you know, Garrett and I very early on, we're like, you know, saw this, as Garrett said, saw this coming that like, you know, already even in that environment, which was significantly more, more tolerant. I mean, everyone from probably, you know, David Sachs to, uh, you know, the Naval would probably agree that even back then when, when they were, you know, I, they would identify probably was more centrist today. They don't, right. They're much more, you could say on the red pill heterodox side. That at that time it was still significantly, uh, you know, you could say it, it was there was still like, well, you know, relative discrimination against people who had center right views, but it was not at the level of which you know the first incident people forget was was like a you know the you could say you could say big incident was was Demore uh, in terms of the the uh, the letter he wrote in Google. No, uh, even second, even before that, Brendan Knight back yeah, in that like was the 20, other one I was 20, make yeah, tw well, what that was, was in twenty fourteen. What was that? Yeah. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, so 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 Brandon is, is actually a buddy of mine, actually because of COVID stuff. Uh, and uh, so he wrote. Uh, no, actually, he sorry, he donated to the prop. Uh, was it prop six, right? Oh, Mozilla, Mozilla, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the yeah. the former one of the the founders 
uh, uh, and the uh, the CEO at the time of Mozilla, he contributed, I think, less than ten thousand. I know it was less than ten thousand dollars. So I think it was a grand. Yeah, yeah, for for a a person who is worth probably you know uh, uh, fifty million, maybe uh, you know for for him to contribute you know a thousand, somewhere between a thousand and ten thousand uh, dollars to a proposition that was uh, pro traditional marriage. I think it was. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, he he contributed a trivial amount of money uh, to that, uh, and and because of that, he was forced out of his position uh, as the CEO of Mozilla uh, uh, back in twenty twenty late twenty thirteen early twenty fourteen. Yeah, and and the as you know, people forget like that proposition actually won right, and it was overturned by by judge later. And the second is like that position itself was you know polling wise uh, way above the majority. So so and, and he got you know he was. Uh, ridiculed and doxxed, et cetera, and then he quit and then he started brave. And and even in these like moments of of James or, or Brendan, and then we had the, the Daily Stormer, right? And then we started seeing more kerfuffle on Facebook in terms of its algos and how it was handling the right news. And people even at that moment, you know, uh, were like, okay, well it can't get that much worse. Oh, it can't get that much worse. Oh, it can't get that much worse. Right. And so to see it sort of accelerate the last uh, two years to be now where every, you know, you have to be living under a rock to like not see or experience the, the political problem that we have with our large tech companies uh, and also their orientation and politics, not only in terms of uh, philanthropy giving and political giving, but also just how they run their platforms now. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just kind of amazing to see where, where we've come when, you know, even I was more in the position, uh, you know, four or five years ago where like a platform has a right to do what it wants with its platform. And to see where we are today, where, you know, back then, when we were having that debate, uh, which was mainly kind of in DC circles and like political circles, like there was still this willingness to say that like a, a free company can do what it wants with, with, with its, with its uh, you know, how it handles recommendations and allowing people on the platform. Uh, but even then, the platform wasn't even really a thing yet. And then now to see that they, you know, they, the president of the United States was the platform, a former president of the United States was the platform, it's sort of like kind of like next level that everything before that, you're like, like, wow, like we could have stopped it earlier, but it just, it literally accelerated to, you know, the most powerful person in the world, uh, you know, got his, got his account canceled and he actually still can't get it back to this day. So, so like this, it, it's, it's kind of a, a, you know, a little bit surreal that like when, when Garrett and I first started doing this and we were canceled before that was even like a thing, it was literally just hosting Rand Paul to like, you know, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't, it was, it was, it was a Liberty Hackathon. That's right. Uh, and it was a very benign sort of. That's you know, the most. I, that is the most. I'm just benign. smiling because on, on the scale of like edgy, but because you said red pill earlier, that's like the least like red pill. Like, if like it that's is. like a. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so like we got canceled for that. You know, and it was in a company I worked at actually, where the slogan was to like discover something new. Was like the slogan. And, so, so just 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 as yeah. context, for, because people who are listening won't know. So Aaron worked at this compo- company, stumbled upon. Uh, they encouraged their team members uh, to host events at their space, uh, uh, which was in San Francisco on Brennan Street. So, you know, central location, great space. So Aaron and another guy uh, who is a co-founder of Lincoln, but no longer active day to day, um, they both worked at StumbleUpon on the, uh, on the engineering team. Uh, and so uh, we, we organized this event to build technology uh, that would advance economic and individual liberty. So that's the, 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 the benign uh, sort of milk toast uh, uh, idea uh, that we, we wanted to focus the hackathon around. Uh, and uh, a few people uh, who also worked at, uh, at uh, StumbleUpon, uh, uh, you know, raised opposition, uh, uh, protested that the event was going to be held there because uh, we got $5,000 from the Koch Foundation. They, they found out about the event. We didn't seek them out, they sought us out. They found out about the event. Uh, you know, we didn't have any money for prizes because this was completely bootstrapped. Uh, they gave us five thousand. Uh, the press found out about it, wrote about it, uh, as if you know the Cokes were coming to uh, to you know invade uh, the Bay Area, uh, and uh, and the CEO uh, was placed in a in a pickle. He had to honor the agreement to allow the event to be there, uh, or cave to the pressure by a few other employees who did not want the event to be there. Uh, and so uh, the CEO decided to. Uh, to rescind the offer for the event to be there. Uh, fortunately, um, ever not Evernote, um, Eventbrite, Eventbrite uh, yeah. hosted the event, and it was a big success. Uh, and uh, and you know, 
it was a regular hackathon. Uh, but but that's the first example uh, in late 2013, early 2014, of uh, of like the just sort of reflexive knee jerk reaction uh, to be opposed to ideas in, in a place that is supposed to to champion and encourage uh, you know diverse ideas uh, you know to to have team members uh, at Aaron's company you know threaten uh, you know to to protest and to resign. Uh, because uh, an event was being held there uh, uh, was the one of the first examples, first signs that we saw um, of uh, of you know just this really escalating to uh, to a really concerning level. Yeah, and in our last minutes, I don't want this to be doom and gloom hour. You guys are still here, so I suspect you don't think you're entirely fighting this pointless, isn't going to go anywhere fight. What? especially for younger people who may be at companies thinking about all these dynamics and aren't just looking to just whine on Twitter, what would you say excites you or that people should focus on? Like, where do you all see this going in the next few years? So I, I am inspired by the opportunity uh, to just build new technologies uh, that solve real problems. I think so many people now are aware of the impact of technology and the vast majority of people who work in technology are not technical. Uh, uh, you know, they're on the sales or support side. Uh, and so, you know, if you are able to, to, you know, find a team, to build a team that can build a solution to, to a problem, you have enormous power. Uh, and it's never been easier, it's never been cheaper. Uh, to build those types of solutions. So, you know, while I think there is a debate to be had around, you know, the, the landscape uh, and how to create a level playing field, um, I, I don't want uh, us as a country or, or us as individuals who believe in free markets to, to, be go, to become so uh, focused on, you know, the, the regulation and the policy. And, and I want us to continue to focus on building, build solutions, to real problems, uh, you know, try to encourage and inspire as much innovation uh, uh, as possible. That's what we're focused on uh, uh, with Lincoln. We we try to to you know provide builders and doers a platform to solve real uh, problems, real policy problems. And so uh, you know, I'm inspired that there's a market for that now more than ever, uh, and uh, and so that's what keeps me going every day. Yeah, the, 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 the good thing is that, you know, the free market capitalist system, like, you know, it works. And in the, the, a lot of the things that we're dealing with, uh, like cultural issues in Silicon Valley, political issues, you know, are, are, I think a consequence of, you could say, uh, you know, late stage effects of companies that I would argue are not as innovative as they used to be. And, and that the, you know, the, the movement, let's say everything from crypto, to uh, the success of like privacy oriented applications for the first time, like Signal uh, is, is a sign of the fact of like the market is moving towards directions that are uh, much like you could say, like it's, it's sort of addressing a lot of these problems itself. And, and we have to be like super cautious on thinking about uh, how we actually approach resolutions to let's say something that really is like a political problem rather than actual fundamental like, a policy problem. And th some of those things can get really like laced together like around 2.30 where a lot of people would talk about 2.30, uh, even you know people that I would agree with on like 80% of other issues don't really know what really 2.30 is. And they sort of think it is something, but really what it's turned into is a political tribal arguing point, not really a debate about policy or about ideas or being first principle. Uh, and, and so as Garrett said, like really, uh, what I find in terms of a lot of these issues, either as a country, we don't we don't like the direction of, let's say, a lot of uh, big tech companies going or Silicon Valley itself. Uh, I'd rather give that to the individual to develop a solution that is superior, because uh, there is even the sense of the uh, you know the, the cultural problems that we're discussing with 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 technology companies. They still make a lot of great things and they still innovate and build amazing products. And, and I think that that's kind of lost again in the political discuss discussion, mm -hmm. less so in the policy discussion. And like the fact that Amazon is like one of the greatest companies that is an American born company, we may disagree with the orientation of like how they run their company or let's say what their, what their uh, you know, uh, chairman of the board does and founder, but from like a fundamental innovation perspective, it's actually amazing. And, and we should continue to encourage 
uh, uh, other innovations like that, like whether it is, you know, more things on the blockchain or Bitcoin or, uh, you know, apps that are decentralizing away from Google or an Apple. And, and, and we should support that. That to me is much more of a policy discussion that is, is edifying because we know that when you, when you, when we go through these different moments of, of uh, we'd say transformations in network capability, right? So like, you know, when we went to mobile devices, when we, when we actually had, um, you know, good uh, at, at home uh, uh, internet connection. And now, you know, in terms of like uh, our own cell phones in terms of getting better, better and better uh, data speeds, like these different moments actually create new, massive new opportunities for new products. And, 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 and also like it, it, a lot of these, the, these like sort of uh, things that, you know, make me sad about a, whether it's Basecamp to, to Coinbase and these sort of like episodes of, of, of political fervor, uh, there is still like lots of these other companies that don't operate that way, that like are offering good products that are competing against them in terms of like, hey, we are a neutral platform. We don't get involved in that. And, and, and that's what I actually wish the internet community will return to. I don't know if they ever can, because it, it may be one of those things that the milk is spilt and it's over. Uh, I, I wish it will return back to its main job, which is to transform the world and continue to make it better, faster, cheaper. And, and that there is a, there's a much, much larger world in terms of you know, what we're competing against uh, rather than in America between red and blue. And, and that's very much lost in terms of this debate. And then I, I think it's actually moving in a better direction, uh, you know, sort of post uh, you say beginning of the Biden administration where we actually are thinking about like, you know, well, what, what's China's capabilities on AI? Like how are they actually interfering on uh, IP side? And, and that they're like, we have a lot of ancient infrastructure in America that actually can be replaced with new innovations, everything from the electricity grid to, as we learned, you know, apparently oil pipes, right? So we learned that that's yeah. something that we need to we need to update from since it's been all around since the 80s. Uh, so these are these are accessible opportunities that entrepreneurs can go tackle that are much greater than just building a photo sharing app or some you know new way of doing email, like these big massive infrastructure problems, or as you know Elon would talk about, like these boring issues uh, that that. Uh, I think places like Lincoln, uh, and you know, I think there's a lot of people in Congress also that orient towards this. That, that that's where we should be pushing a lot of Silicon Valley talent is like try these things or try these like big area audacious goals. Like you know, sure, if you just want to build a social app, that's great. But like in terms of the things that in terms of America needs in terms of making uh, you know as being a patriot, like those are the things that we also need to be pushing and, and creating more accessible windows for innovation. Yeah, no, that's that's so well said. And you know, as we're closing out here, I appreciate how the two of you were able to end on like a forward-looking note because the point is, it isn't 2013, it isn't 2016, and there really are different dynamics in these eras, and there are possibilities that are open to people. So I hope folks can be pushed in that direction and can focus there. So, um, any anything you guys want to shout out? Anything you're interested in? Um, Lincoln Network, obviously. Um, I suspect. Yeah. Is go to thing. go to go to joinlincoln.org uh, and you know let us know what you can bring to the table on the policy side. Go to calldeploy.com if you are a engineer, product manager, designer, and you want to get paid to solve some of these important policy problems, we would love to work with you. Uh, so we want to, again, encourage as much innovation as possible, and we need to work with the smartest people possible to do that. That's awesome. Thanks for joining, guys. Thanks.